I guess moving along to the Europeans, uh, let's talk about Belgium. Now, Belgium, uh, like I said, one of the teams, uh, European teams on the Conte Verde. And uh, some of the, I guess we already touched up on the fact that uh, the training regimen was, uh, uh, I guess, minimal, so, so to speak, on the ship itself. Basically, they were on the ship with the Romania and France, and each team would take turns to, uh, I guess, for physical training, uh, like you said, running around, uh, fitness exercises, and uh, it later turned out that by the time, this was a two weeks trip, let's say, by the time that uh, they reached their destination, there were some reports that a lot of play, many of the players had put on weight. In fact, there's one report of uh, one of the players, Bernard Verhoof, has gained as much as 20 pounds. And uh, I guess, is it just a fact that there's not enough physical conditioning or is too much partying? I mean, I don't know. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the real story on that? Well, I think, um, I think, that they obviously they did they did have methods of training and um, like the jogging around the deck the gymnasium some some uh, descriptions have them lifting each other and uh, uh, they could lift weights as well jumping over it inanimate objects but I th think it fundamentally came down to uh, even though uh, they spent about around about a week no about around two weeks on the ship there was a, a very that they there was lots for them to do and uh and while they did have their training reg regime they there was a lot of luxury food on board and i think that that was the key to it really the and they uh, uh these perhaps some of them over overindulged a bit too much because the uh, there was one description of, of them having five course meals you know and uh and that included uh, you know that's not to to mention the breakfast and lunch and even um that the uh snacks in between lunch and dinner not otherwise known as tea in in, in the uk that's what some people say um so i think yeah it, it, it came down to the 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 it's the exquisite cuisine really um obviously there's the um oscar van Kispe, van Kespi, I forget, can't pronounce his right name properly. The head of de delegation, he um, he didn't uh, put on any weight at all. But that was only because he was seasick. Um, oh. As um, I think uh, the um, the Bolivia, uh, the Belgian goalkeeper Arnold Badu said uh, wrote about that uh, in an not wrote about that said, said stated that in an interview. But um, but the. Uh, but um, Jean, the, the Belgian referee Jean Longenu, he um, right. he he wrote ex extensively about their trip, and right. um, yeah, that's uh, that, yeah, he's not a fascinating character. Uh, it seems like um, when I was doing my research, it it appeared like most of the European perspective on the World Cup is basically upon his writing and his account of uh, the World Cup. But you, uh, I think you said there may have been more journalists uh, that may have covered as far as Europeans, but uh, somehow <coughs> his, uh, I guess his take on the event is more critical or, you know. Well, no, I, I, I do, I think I agree with you uh, about the, uh, a lot of the, some of the books i mean i think uh, for instance uh brian glanville he's he wrote, wrote he's written many books about the world cup and i think he right. he he based his a lot of his his information when he was writing about the uh, uruguay 1930 on on the account of um longinu because you can see similarities in, in, in what longinu states um they they um they um they had difficulties on their tr initial travels because um, with their suitcases for instance when they because um, they arrived in they left Brussels um, and they arrived in Paris and when they got to Paris they realised that their, the, the touring company that they had um, 
uh, the travel company that had made their arrangements had had, um, had booked their, their luggage onto another train. So one of them had to, that name's like 58 suitcases in total, and one of them had to stay behind in Paris while the others went, um, traveled into uh, to Spain, into Barcelona. And uh, so he had to take another train with, the, with these 58 suitcases. The only problem was because of these travel arrangements and the direction this train was going, because it wasn't going directly in the in the direction of Spain, it had to tra- it had, it actually had to change trains about four times. So that these fifty eight suitcases had to be had to be changed uh, oh, wow. to, to four four different trains, and um, they w- it would have eventually um, uh, reach Barcelona in time. Um, Longini apparently had trouble with one of his suitcases because it was full of cigars and um, and cigarettes, and uh, and one of the Belgian players thought it would be funny to. Uh, to tell the customs what he had in his suitcase, and he had a bit of trouble uh, um, getting it to, on board the ship eventually. Because uh, uh, initially, I think it was cons- uh, confiscated at the uh, Spanish border. No, it was initially confiscated in Paris, but they they allowed it because they couldn't get the suitcase open because it was it was sealed with like these leather strapping, the, these lead strapping. Yeah. It, they couldn't open the suitcase, so they allowed it to go onto the Spanish border, onto onto Spain. It was in here, a, a, and the Spanish custom officer was refusing to allow Longini to take his suitcase. But it, fortunately for him, he uh, he knew there was a, another uh, custom officer that was there present that he knew, and this other, this, so he helped him get through customs by getting the, the the custom officer who initially refused to to allow it through. He, he, told him to go and take a walk uh, so he wouldn't see what would be happening basically so so um Longinu eventually was allowed to take his 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 cigarettes and cigars with him to uh on board the ship um but Longinu's account is he wrote his account initially it was published in a book in 1944 i believe uh on Siflon Le Monde, I think the title is. It's called it, the English title is "Whistling in the Wind," mm-hmm. but it's actually a very descriptive account and uh, and quite very well written. Um, so, for instance, um, he when they uh, boarded the ship, and this is what he described. He, he states. Uh, the sea was spread without a wrinkle the ship gliding effortlessly on the wave it was a joy to walk around the deck and look around the, the bow protruded more into the foam at the front and traced on the surface long white threads that stretched on either side of the hull at the end of the stern these threads branched into an infinite number of little white threads and made up a marvellous memorial mosaic on the mirror of the sea the fascinating spectacle could be seen for hours on end and with the same patience fixed the deep current that propellers raised at the back of the ship the blue wall was cut into a thousands thousands of green facets like grass covered by the white brown and gray foam the brown smoke coming from the chimney of the, the ship stretched out like a giant plunge above the boiling water an immense an immense transparent blue sky dominated the ocean reflecting in millions of golden glitter the warm southern sun so he's very, he's very descriptive and 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 very evo- he evokes these these very strong images of 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 of, of that of that journey. And uh, uh. as far as yeah, and uh, he's always looked upon as one of the greatest authorities in terms of refereeing for that era. Uh, would it be fair to say like he was the most famous referee of that time, or that just because of the nineteen uh-huh. World Cup? I think well he he um he he did he did referee the um Olympic final didn't he between Uruguay and Argentina in 1928 so he 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 was the um uh apparently one of the most famous coaches I before I I'd, I'd have, have ugh, before I'd ever come across his his book um I'd always wondered if if his reputation as one of the best referees at the time was actually true, you know, because I knew that the accounts he apparently wrote for, um, I've, I've seen referenced other way, the accounts he wrote for uh, the German magazine kicker for the World Cup. Apparently he would, um, he would write about 
his own performances and he would refer to him as a third person and how the referee had a great performance so when when you have a referee describing his own performance as a great performance you have to wonder whether or not you know there was a uh this he was someone who was always truthful i guess or exaggerated and i i think i called him and because i, I knew that some especially in the world cup games as well had some people had issues with his referee and I, I, I'd always wondered if if uh, if he was the best referee and uh, I don't know my opinion of him has slightly changed when I came across his book I, I do actually think he was actually uh, 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 he, what he described was actually pretty good and from that point of view he's a good source so my opinion my estimation of him has gone up uh, over the years and obviously that's got nothing to do with what I think of him as a referee because it comes down to opinions I guess who who do you think is was the best re- best referee at the time because obviously um, he refereed the final didn't he and um, right. and he, 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 he got heavily criticised in that final by the Argentinians Right, right, but I guess any referee would have been criticized by you would think uh, by yeah, the losing team. Yeah. But yeah, and uh, yeah, and as far as the the Belgian players, once they got to Uruguay, what was the training? How was it any different than uh, you know, say this the, the other teams? Well, they they did have their um, their training exercises, but I think. They, they would uh, invariably each team that would arrive in in Uruguay um, would be assigned a local club to um, to be based at or to train at their or to train at their grounds at right. and uh, so they would uh, train daily uh, or when they could and sometimes they would other other I know there's there's examples and testimony of other teams um, visiting other places uh you know be invited by uh certain groups uh in uruguay to special events but um what i understand about the belgians is because obviously a lot of them couldn't speak spanish most of them uh, and they couldn't read any of the newspapers they um they got they got a little bored by their by their um uh their time in Uruguay especially I think because they arrived on the July the 5th and they wouldn't play their opening game until the um, the 13th of July so you know if if, if uh, and uh, th- so this example of them getting bored is this is the only reference I, I've I found of the about um, Belgian players I, I haven't found that example with the other players from the other countries getting bored but we don't we don't know uh, uh, but I can imagine if 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 yeah, and uh, I've you know other accounts I've heard of other sources I've read about Belgium is they blame the fact that they didn't have proper physical training and things like that for I guess being unprepared, but uh, you know that may be true. wrong. I mean, like I said, so because um, uh, I think that doesn't I think the the, uh, the um, the Belgian goalkeeper says that, doesn't he? I think in in one of his interviews about them being slightly unprepared. Um, yeah, Arnold Badria. He was a, a last surviving member of that 1930 team, and uh, yeah, I remember he was interviewed in 1990 for the, from on this Belgian magazine, uh, Foot Magazine, and uh, a lot of my uh, I guess account of the Belgium the Belgian perspective is from his interview. Yeah, and uh, he also touched up on the fact that on the return trip, I think I may have mentioned this before to you, that he got into a physical fight with uh, Jean de B, the other goalkeeper, and it was like a knocked out, you know, fist fight. And afterwards, they had to, they were bruised and battered, both of them, and they went to the dinner as if nothing had happened. They sat on the table, and everyone was yeah. amused about what had happened. But yeah, but he claims they well, became very d- good friends. Afterwards, yeah. Well, was Jean de B had always been uh, um, the first he'd be team the starter, right? He was he was a starter when yeah. the 1920 Olympics and 24 and 1920 Olympics when they won actually on home soil. Uh, yeah, that's right. Because he was a he was Olympic champion, weren't he? He was Olympic right. champion, right? Yeah. So um, and 
by then I guess uh, this is like kind of towards the tail end of his career somewhat internationally at least and uh, by then Arnold Baju was the starter so that may have been a source of tension who knows but yeah and and he was younger as well I think he was in around 21 as well so there could be a little right, bit of envy right. there couldn't right. there? yeah um because um yeah because he I mean in terms of they I mean he states that um that on the on the ship they would dance every night which also while it promoted a, a certain condition that they were ultimately physically and pre- mentally not prepared so they they, they certainly didn't know what to expect when they got there and um right. I, I guess when you've been on the ship for so long and uh, I think there's a references to the American team that they they state that they, they they say you know once you've been on the ship for two weeks once you get off you have to kind of uh, when you when you're on the ship you have to kind of find your sea legs and obviously when you get we've been on the ship for so for two weeks uh, when you get off you have to kind of find your land legs so to speak um, right, you know, right. I get I guess there's a version of that um, jet leg syndrome but right, for right. for you know because yeah. it takes a while to get back to the swing of things especially if you've been two weeks on the sea I guess yeah so that makes sense yeah and uh, I mean obviously there's descriptions of of uh, of them struggling with the um, the motion of the ship you know that would bring about a lot of a lot of seasickness for a lot of these right. um, these people these players and stuff but um, and also they um, you know ultimately uh, uh they they very much disappointed in the tournament. Yeah, see, they they obviously went into the tournament um, highly highly fan. I think they were actually one of the seeded teams, uh, not the seeded team. Sorry, one uh, considered the best out of the four European teams because right. of their, um, you know, because they were because they had this because they won the Olympic Games in 1920. Uh, they they had a decent. Performance against Argentina in the 28 Olympics, and where they 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 lost six three, but they the way they came back game, that's right. Uh, the way they came back into the game, that that, that sort of uh, that was impressive, and they, I think they'd beaten um, France as well, just before the tournament, where um, right. uh, two one in Paris, I believe, and um, and obviously they had issues, didn't they, with um, certain player selections. Uh, right. I think there was uh, you, you on your blog. You mentioned uh, three other players apart from Raymond Brown. Was it Jules L- Levine or something? Uh, one, one of them. And uh, right, I guess they were not given uh, uh, time off from their employers. And, yes, uh, which was a common story amongst most of the teams. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean Raymond Brown is obviously the most important example. I guess he was considered one of the stars of the team. And, he was, uh, I guess, uh, removed from the team for what I guess what could be considered by today's standards, you know, uh, unbelievable reason, you know. Uh, yeah. Basically, he was removed because he had opened up a restaurant, and your players were not allowed to have "quote unquote" commercial activities outside of the game, and that's a really yeah. broad definition, but that's a reason why. Uh, I guess they they removed him from the team and uh, uh, and subsequently had to become a professional in Czechoslovakia. And, yeah, it was, uh, it was it it was essentially because they they would use that that um the, their name their fame as a player to promote that like their their business and therefore it, that would transcend into the uh, uh, professional ethic that was that they opposed in Belgium at the time because it was very amateur. I think yeah. um they. Only have adopted professionalism in Belgium in the fifties, I believe. It right, was it right. would take a long, long time. But um, right. on the day that um, you know, Belgium played the uh, United States, uh, their star man Ramon Brain was playing for Sparta uh, Prague. I thought, was it is it Sparta Prague or Slavia Sparta Prague? Prague? I think it, Sparta. yeah, Sparta. Sparta. Think. Sparta he, he was playing for Sparta Prague against a Vienna team. I forget which Vienna team it was. It was one of these intercontinental early European Cup tournaments that was being played at the time. Yeah. And he he was instrumental in Sparta Prague's three and a win over Aus- this Austrian team. So and this was on the very day that um Belgium themselves got dispatched three nil by the Americans. So um they 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 severely missed him in that respect. The uh, the Belgians they were considered 
Um, they had the, some of their forwards like Fernanda, Ferdinand Adams, who was actually um, a second division player, I believe. He was quite quick. He was, and um, most of the counts I've I've read of the um, of that game is that for the first 15 minutes, they the Belgians were quite uh, on top and they had um, their chances to really and the Americans couldn't really get into the game and eventually um, they the, the problems with the, the Belgians had was that their inability to um, to to uh, finish off their chances basically because they, they would shoot wide a lot they would miss they would miss their opportunities they would uh, the goalkeeper they, they they wouldn't place their shots accurately enough that it was easy for the goalkeeper to make saves and the Americans uh, would ultimately go on to dominate uh, eventually once they they uh, got used to the muddy conditions because the pitch was quite muddy but and I think that had an effect on, on, on the outcome of the game because um, in terms of the quality of the game and, and the Americans they had adopted this kind of um, long long ball game which they, they would uh, uh, launch into the wings and I think that was a bit more suited to the, the conditions because the, the Belgians tried playing a passing game which was totally unsuited to the to the muddy conditions which they found them getting stuck in and so uh, they got um, uh, uh, the 3-0 the, the defeat perhaps flattened uh, the the uh, the Americans but um, so when when the Belgians would go on to play their last game against Paraguay and um they essentially found themselves in a group which probably could be considered the group of death in this in this World Cup because the United States, uh, when when the FIFA were trying to determine the um, the group system, uh, they had to find obviously the four group seeds. They decided upon Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil, but they couldn't really decide on between the United States and Paraguay, and. Uh, so they decided to put the United States and Paraguay into the same group, uh, uh, partly because Paraguay, you know, they've been highly um, touted. They've been perceived to be one of the fav- uh, best best teams in South America because they finished runners up at the, at the 1929 South American Championships. And the Americans, on the other hand, they were considered to be a professional outfit, and uh, they were they were openly professional. So. Um, so that in trying to because they, they couldn't determine who who should be the group C, they decided to put them in the group together, and they went and put the the what was considered the best European team in that group as well. So um, you could you could consider that the group of death, although you know the group one could also be considered quite a strong group. No, right, right. But um, obviously, so when they uh, they they, they would go on to play their last game uh, against Paraguay, they would all. Um, that game was meaningless in, in so far as um, yeah, yeah. that both, both both teams had been eliminated by that time because Paraguay lost to the Americans 3-0. But what, what what's quite interesting is that 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 game might have had a bit more competitive nature to it if not for the fact that um, FIFA decided or the organizer decided to cancel the um, cons- consolation tournament that they initially had planned for the the teams finishing runners up in each of the group. Right. So they they, they they initially decided upon this format uh, that all group runners up would, would would play in a consolation tournament like they had with the Olympic Games. Right, the early exactly the early Olympic tournaments had I forgot what is called the Bergwald system or something some name like that and yeah like I, you I said uh, the the I guess the teams that had been eliminated would be grouped in a separate like you said a consolation tournament. And they just play one another. Yeah, basically parallel with the actual tournament. The, you know. Yeah, I mean, initially, um, um, there were people like Henri Dunne that wanted the World Cup to be based on a, a knockout cup system. But obviously, when they only had thirteen nations compete in the in the first World Cup, they had to base it on a on a group system, which was more familiar to the South Americans because they they would play the South American championships, the Copa America, on a round robin group basis. So, and it, and in a, in a sense, we know it makes a little bit more sense, really, because you can't have. It, it seems strange to invite all these teams from 
far off distances to just come play one potentially play one one game if it's a knockout tournament uh, so uh, we we know now that probably the group the group system is a lot better than the cup system but we know why the cup, the cup system the knockout cup system can be um, entertaining in itself of course but if you if you travel such vast distances it doesn't make much sense to travel so long for one game but um so they initially envisaged this this consolation tournament as well to add on but for some reason i think because excuse me because brazil uh had had stated that they weren't gonna play in it that they decided to cancel the tournament so this one game and the brazil v bolivia game were two were, were turn out to be two meaningless games, but that's not to say that they weren't competitive. But they could have had a bit more competitive edge if it, if if the fact that um if these uh uh this consulta- consolation tournament hadn't been cancelled. Right. I don't know if you want to ask a question, but oh uh, no, go ahead. You want to say more about the games or about the Belgium? Oh yeah, so Belgium Paraguay. I, uh, it was it wasn't very competitive. There was um, uh, it was only one goal in it. There, um, uh, the there wasn't much to write about. Then the, the Belgians had decent starts that like that Paraguay game, and uh, uh, they had some shots that hit the crossbar. Um, they faced a goalkeeper that was producing some good saves. Uh, and it was quite a balanced game, but um, and the Belgians actually showed a little bit more uh, superior technique to the the Paraguayans right. in the early in the first half. Uh, it was and the, uh, so, and, all, like you said, there's nothing to play for. In in, in the end, it was really matched. And nothing was played to play for. So you know. Yeah, I mean the Paraguayans. I was just going to say the Paraguayans did start to play a lot better and they would get their goal after 35 minutes through um, um, Benitez Caceres from a pass from Gonzalez. Um, uh, and they started, the Paraguayans started to, to dominate and the Belgians had the same problems with their shooting ability really and it was it was just a failure to get to to find the target and, and, and the, accuracy, the inaccuracy of their shooting uh, so we can see why they, they I mean they had four at least four of their best players were missing from the from the team and I think that really really showed um, that they suffered at the hands of that I think this concludes part one of our interview stay tuned for part two thank you